House of Tragedy by Nancy Roberts Carnton House is probably Tennessee's best-known haunted house. There will never be another Carnton House, his friend had said. Never a place that's seen such tragedy and grief. Perhaps that was the reason Paul Levitt was determined to go there. Up the curving drive, set far back from the road, the house stood alone in a grove of maple trees, its dark windows staring out from between tall white columns. There was something lonely and mysterious about it. November 30th had been one of those timeless autumn days, but now it was late afternoon with darkness falling fast. As Paul drove up to the house in his black Ferrari, he realized that he had arrived too late. It was just after five and the tour guides would have already left. Well, it didn't matter. He would walk about the grounds. All was quiet. He and this house were alone in another world. The only sound was the faint crunching of his footsteps on the gravel drive. It was a time to think and to absorb the unfathomable atmosphere of this place that his friend John Carter had described. Underfoot, a profusion of leaves lay like a golden treasure spread out by some profligate Midas. It seemed almost wrong to tread upon such beauty. Bending down, Paul picked up one perfect five-pointed yellow maple leaf, then another. But on the second leaf were splotches of crimson, bright as blood. It reminded him of how many men had suffered and died here. What was it his great-grandmother in Ohio once said? Something like your great-granddaddy fought in a terrible battle at a place called Franklin. He was walking over the same ground where his ancestor had fought. Wasn't it a strange coincidence that today was the anniversary of that struggle? It had lasted just five hours but what a bloody, disastrous battle it had been. Paul walked without considering the time, for he was in no hurry to return to the motel. He found the pressure of his work beginning to leave him. Almost automatically, his feet followed a path that led from the house across the fields. Where was he going? Did it matter? Finally, the path brought him around the back of the house, and near the porch he saw the figure of a man getting on a horse. If the fellow paused, Paul decided he would speak to him. On second thought, he would take the initiative and hail him. Hello there. Nice horse. Yep. Had my own horse shot out from underneath me, but... I suppose it doesn't matter. Whether you ride or whether you go on foot, you're still at their mercy tonight. This was strange talk. Paul wasn't frightened, but he did find himself tingling slightly. The man spoke again. If you're coming with me, you'd better find a pistol or a carbine. Otherwise, you won't last long out there. But not many of us will live through the night anyway. What was he talking about, thought Paul, now close enough to see the man fairly well. He had a mustache, a short beard, and eyes that bored straight through you. And he sat there in the after dusk, humming to himself. We are a band of brothers and native to the soil. Mm Mm-hmm. And when our rights were threatened, the cry rose near and far. Hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star. 
Good Lord, thought Paul. They must be having one of those battle reenactments out here today, and this fellow thinks that I'm part of it. From his dress, Paul assumed that the man was an officer. His hat was black cloth, with small gilt buttons on the sides. Strands of gold braid met in the front in a four-leaf clover without a stem. He wore it with the leather visor pulled down, almost as if he were trying to protect his face. At his belt were not only a carbine and pistol, but a stout sword as well. What kind of carbine is that you're wearing? It's an Enfield fifty-eight caliber. What do you have? Me? Uh, nothing. Man, I'd just seen them in books. I've never shot one or a pistol either. A sword? I wouldn't know what to do with that. The stranger raised his eyebrows in surprise. You'd better go over to that Carter house, then, or into town. This is no place for you tonight. That fool Hood thinks he's as brilliant as Lee, but he's sending my men to be slaughtered. Then he seemed to be talking to someone by his side. The officer's voice rose in anger. They have three lines of works, and they are all completed. If there was a reply, Paul didn't hear it. But he did hear the officer's voice once more, and above the rustle of autumn leaves, the words floated back to him, strong and clear. Well, Govan, if we're going to die, let us die like men. With that, Paul saw the stranger who had never bothered to introduce himself, fling his cap furiously into the air, and then right off. From the distance came the shout, Charge, men! Charge! Do you hear me? Do you hear? And the sound of the voice faded away in a maelstrom of shot and shell, musketry and cannon. Then smoke, or was it mist, seemed to lie all about him. Paul thought he heard a regiment band strike up the strains of Annie Laurie. A few seconds later came the most awesome sound that Paul had ever heard. A veritable chorus of men's voice shattered the air with the fierce, blood-curdling attack cry that Union troops had quickly learned was the rebel yell. Paul Levitt did what many raw recruits had done when they heard that yell. He began to run. He ran. His heart pounded. He seemed to be surrounded by the fire of thousands of small arms and the roar of shells. Death pervaded the very atmosphere. He thought he was heading back to his car, but losing his sense of direction, he found himself stumbling about in the graveyard, not far from the house. It was a cemetery provided by Carnton shortly after the battle, because a day later more than 1,700 Confederate men lay dead in the fields near this home. Finally, Paul made it back to his car. What was it his friend Carter had said? That on this ground, the rows of dead once stood six men deep, so close they could not even fall. Paul slept poorly, for all night long he dreamed that he was in the midst of one furious charge after another. But early the next morning, he was out of the house again. If he had been part of some supernatural experience or seen a ghost as he believed he had, he wanted to understand it. He was fortunate to arrive on a day when Bernice Sieberling was there. Miss Sieberling is a delightful gray-haired lady with a thorough knowledge of history of Carnton and had been long guiding visitors through the house. I would imagine that a house with this much history has some ghost stories connected with it, Paul said tentatively, as a way to introduce the subject. Oh my, yes, 
said Miss Sieberling, not reluctant to share the stories of some of the spirits, and she began to talk about a former cook at Carnton during the Civil War days and the ghost's way of getting attention. I had been aware of her for quite a while, for I would hear glasses clinking in the kitchen as if someone were washing dishes. Then I began to hear her in other areas of the house. One day I had a tour going, and it sounded as if rocks were being thrown at the windows and breaking them. Most of the noises were coming from one room. When we reached it, we found a framed picture of the house lying face up on top of the heater, its glass shattered into a million pieces. It was as though someone had carefully placed it there. One of the men on the tour took his camera and made a picture of it, for he said, it's impossible for that picture to have fallen in such a way. On another occasion, Miss Sieberling continued, I was here alone on a cold winter day and kept hearing a noise in a small enclosed porch at the back of the house, so I went to investigate. We keep a box of old glass panes on the shelf there. I found two panes of the thin old glass, unbroken, one lying on each side of the door. The box, of course, was still on the shelf. It's as though the spirit has a sense of humor and likes to play tricks on me. We had all heard things, but had no idea what was causing them until one day a descendant of the Carnton family said, You know, there was a murder in this house, don't you? It seems that one of the field hands murdered a young girl in the kitchen in the early 1840s or before, probably due to some motive such as jealousy. There was prejudice on the part of house servants towards those who did the heavy work on the plantation, and the girl may have rejected the field hand or had another sweetheart. Sometimes it sounds exactly like dishes are being washed, One night, ten of us were all in the dining room having our regular board meeting of the Carnton Society. The lady sitting beside me turned to me and said, I think I hear someone in the kitchen. I just answered, no. She turned to me again in a few minutes and said, I know someone is in there. And this time I said, there is no one in the kitchen. She got up and went back there. When she returned and sat down, she had the strangest expression on her face. You're right, she said. No one is there. I told the other members of the board about hearing the cook and her antics, and they believed me. Even many visitors who come here ask if we have spirits in the house. It amazes me that strangers seem to feel it, although there are a lot of workmen around and we don't hear the spirits as much. A workman told me he saw a beautiful girl with dark hair in the upstairs hall. His eyes were huge and his face was white. He won't work up there now unless someone is with him. Whether he saw one of the two surviving Carnton children who had grown into womanhood or not, I don't know. The Cartons lost three children out of five in infancy. That seems shocking to us, but many people didn't even live to middle age a hundred or so years ago. Paul had begun to doubt that he would hear any story relating to his own experience when finally Mrs. Sieberling changed the subject. I hope you won't think I'm silly when I tell you something else that has been reported to us here. Visitors say they have seen a Confederate soldier who walks the perimeter of this property. I don't laugh at them anymore, for there have been many times in the late afternoon, especially in the fall, when I have heard my own ghost soldier, or should I say the sound of heavy footsteps. When I hear those striding feet, I 
pretty to look out, but the back veranda is always empty. This house was used as a hospital after the Battle of Franklin, and the bodies of four Confederate generals were placed on the back porch. The most loved general was the Irishman, Pat Claiborne. All the next day, men who had survived the battlefield passed. It is said that when Claiborne died, the South lost a general second only to Stonewall Jackson. Before he was buried, Mrs. Carey McGavock, mistress of the plantation, took the general's cap, later presenting it to the State of Tennessee Museum. What did the cap look like? Paul asked. It was a round, black cap with little buttons on each side. I don't know how many. And there were stripes of gold braid that came up from the front and ran into a four-leaf clover. Oh, poor General Claiborne. They say he was a very brave man. Black with gold braid. A four-leaf clover. Paul remembered that cap. And as Mrs. Sieberling went on talking, he missed part of what she was saying about the names of former residents of Carnton. People who have lived here and others in the area have reported hearing a Confederate soldier pace to and fro on the front porch. They come back and ask if I have heard him, and I tell them, yes, I have heard him many times. Struck by the similarity of the cap and the officer he had seen, and the one belonging to the general, Paul had heard what he had come to find out. He believed that the stranger he had been seeing the evening before was none other than the spirit of General Pat Claiborne. But... How could he tell Mrs. Sieberling such a story? He simply just let her talk on. I warn you that this house has a pull about it, and if you ever visit, you'll come back, said Bernice Sieberling. People return again and again. Return again and again, echoed Paul in his mind. Maybe the spirits do too, he thought. Carnton is a timeless place. It is a place where the dead once stood, so close they could not fall, where bullets came thick as rain, where soldiers pulled their caps down over their face in a desperate, futile attempt to protect themselves. It is a place to shudder at men's ferocity toward other men. It is probably Tennessee's most haunted house. Carton Plantation is in Franklin, Tennessee, not far from Nashville. The house is open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5, and Sunday 11 to 5. Classic tours are offered throughout the day. The plantation's 22 rooms contain much of the original furnishings, which are from the period of 1820 to 1860. All the woodwork is wood grain to resemble mahogany or rosewood. The house was decorated not long after the excavation of Pompeii when mustard yellow, soldier blue, and Pompeii red were in vogue. On a personal closing note, this particular story in the Battle of Franklin is near and dear to my heart. Like so many other battles the American Civil War, my family was heavily involved on both sides. I had an uncle who was captured at the Battle of Franklin. Of the men that he was captured with that day, he was the only survivor to leave Andersonville Prison, or otherwise known as Camp Sumter to some. These veterans, and those before, and those who have followed since, even up to today, deserve to be remembered. On this day of 9-11, and soon to be Veterans Day, these men and women who have sacrificed, and in many cases given their full measure, regardless of political feeling or climb, deserve to be remembered. 
lest we forget the end.